One thing that mm -hmm. I've heard, and I want you to react to this, mm -hmm. is some have said that, well, the activity, let's say if there was some kind of Al-Aqsa triangle, or uh, the activity of the strategy of blockading the Strait of Hormuz, Suez Canal, all of the, you know, Bab al Mendeb, will actually in the long term hurt Russia and China more because they depend more on that kind of uh, uh, of trade in Asia. But we have seen Russia and China have been, not been targeted in this very particular blockade uh, that Yemen's forces at Ansar Allah has enacted. So react to that, react to the long term strategy, how this would affect and how uh, this strategy does uh, have a very, it seems like a very clear target, which is the United States, the hegemon. Um, and well, I, at the same time, you've noted, you've said that Russia and China, especially Russia, have been actually supporting uh, these measures in, in many respects. So uh, could you elaborate on that in the context of, uh, of this uh, I've heard it being talked about that Russia and China long term might actually well, be affected I, negatively. I answered your question in my introduction, more or less. In fact, uh, the fact that uh, this is happening and Russia and China are not saying absolutely anything against it, it's I would say it's more than conclusive proof that there has been some serious, serious um, uh, back in the room dialogue. There's no, there's no question about that. And the, China know that they could lose a little bit in terms of, um, but their their ships are not being targeted. Russian ships are not being targeted. Iranian ships are not being targeted. And from the beginning, uh, Ansarullah, they were extremely careful to circumscribe their actions. This is only Israeli ships or ships who are delivering anything, whatever, cargo, merchandise, oil, gas, etc., to Israel. And then after the so-called declaration of war by Yus Yusuk, United States, United Kingdom, they said, okay, so your, 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 your ships are also targets. Of course, you declare war, basically you declare war against us. We didn't declare war against you. We declared war against Israel. And in fact, we did not declare war against Israel. We were we implemented something to wake up the rest of the world to what Israel is doing, because of uh, what we explained in the in our introduction, those humanitarian, religious, and moral values. So Russia and China and the BRICS, they are a sort of uh, I would say a combo in the background, giving a sort of uh, nearly invisible moral support to what the, the Houthis are doing out of moral support for Gaza. So this is a way, for instance, for the Chinese, which don't want to get involved deeply in anything in West Asia, apart from trade deals, to make their position, in fact, quite explicit. And at the same time, like, like we commented, starting to ask for serious negotiations towards a sovereign Palestinian state. And the Russian position, everybody knows, is way more complicated. But at the same time, it, 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 it amounts to their, uh, let's say, hidden ghost support to Yemen amounts to the same thing. And the rest of, and in terms of public opinion, is amazing. Virtually the whole global south is behind Yemen. And people are stunned that a country that was bombed for seven years nonstop by a coalition where the U.S. was leading from behind. Don't forget that. It was Saudi Arabia and the Emirates in the beginning. Then the Emirates just left because they knew that this was going nowhere. So basically it was a coalition of Saudi Arabia and, with, of course, American weapons and American support from behind. And Houthis, they survived everything. And when there was the, the 2022 ceasefire, it was in fact a Houthi victory in practice. And Obviously, those with a brain in Riyadh, they can pick up the phone and call Washington and say, look, don't mess with these guys. You have no idea who you're messing with. And obviously, nobody in Washington has any idea of what the Houthis are about. Not those people uh, at the State Department, 
Certainly not. Maybe a few CIA specialists, but they are not being listened to. And obviously, the old guard CIA, they know very well how tough the, the Yemenis are. So, so, uh, uh, but it, but it's a, it, it's a, it's a circle of viciousness and incompetence, in fact, and, and it links to, for instance, it links to two of the most important books of the year, who happen to have been published these past few days. In fact, one of them is going to come out in, in two weeks, and the other one came out uh, two weeks ago. Uh, Emmanuel Todd's book about the defeat of the West, and Glenn Dyson's book about. Um, possibility of a future Westphalian system, but uh, a real Westphalian system, a new world order based on Eurasia. His book is coming out in two weeks. And if, if, you, if you read these books together, which is something that I did, I read, uh, <laughs> and, and then I wrote about both with an interval of two weeks, but I read them in sequence. And they basically are from two, uh, very interesting, two European intellectuals. One French, one Scandinavian. Basically, uh, uh, Glenn in, in Norway, he is, uh, you know, he's considered a Putinista, uh, castle culture, you name it. And Todd, because he has this enormously important background as a historian, as an anthropologist, as a demographer, as a sociologist, as a political analyst, etc., they cannot touch him, but uh, and discredit him. But uh, he was ignored by most of the mainstream media. In fact, the, the, the mainstream media ignored him. Uh, alternative or semi-alternative media, of course, uh, radio, radio in France, he became a superstar again, etc. And they're saying the same thing. They, they're explaining why the West, as the collective West, failed in the Ukraine project. Um, they explain that this in terms of uh, not only a cognitive dissonance, but in, in the way Todd organizes his book is even more important because it has to do with the, with education, falling of standards of education, and, of course, neoliberalism predominating over everything, and the basis of what we now have as a told, uh, sort of liberal totalitarianism and cancel culture. He studies that very well in the book as well, even if the book is not about that, but you need that for context. And uh, uh, Glenn Deason focuses more on... Uh, uh, all the backstories leading to the special military operation, which is going to be uh, two years old soon, right? And when we look at the uh, overall reasons of why the West is failing, it comes back to the same, uh, the same basic uh, uh, set of, of reasons. Uh, falling of uh, uh, the standards of education, uh, what happened after the end of... Uh, of the Soviet Union, where the Americans uh, believed themselves that they were the winners uh, with ir unrestricted powers, and it was the beginning of a new era of another American century with no competitors, and uh, they more or less assumed that their mission, a Mackinder-esque mission of uh, preventing the emergence of two, uh, one or two. Uh, peer competitors in Eurasia was fulfilled because China was still developing and Russia was destroyed. The post-Soviet uh, uh, Union, Russia was destroyed. So we had this interregnum. Then we had uh, the war on terror, which was uh, a war out of nothing to the benefit only of this Zeocon brigade, which they lost, by the way, including in Iraq. And now, finally, uh, we have... Uh, I would say uh, political realism is back when we see two big powers, resurgent big powers, united in a strategic partnership and telling the hegemon, look, free, your free lunch is over. We're starting a new thing now and we have the whole global south behind us. So how can you expect the, pe the people who really run the show in D.C. to accept that? They won't. And that's the problem for all of us because we know we are what we're dealing with is explosive in terms of they are going to cause a big explosion because they cannot handle reality, pure and simple. And reality now is strike them in the face in terms of all those failures from everywhere, from West Asia to the rest of Eurasia as, as a whole, especially, you know, their failure in Africa. 
Uh, since since the uh, the end of colonialism, since the beginning of post colonialism, which was never really post colonialism, because you know if you look at West uh, Western Africa, it continued to be colonized by France, and it, and it still is. This is a, a new process that has just started, and the same in Latin America, and in Latin America, obviously they always have their favorite fifth columnists which is the case of the Argentinian Chainsaw Massacre now, which is perfect. The, the guys from Central Casting, in, in terms of having a fifth columnist to destroy Argentina from the inside, Brazil-Argentina relations, uh, Argentina-China relations, and intra-BRICS relations. It's perfect. You know, no one, uh, this morning I was, I, I, I was uh, watching his interview to the Wall Street Journal and the editor of the Wall Street Journal, she was having an orgasm interview with Millet. He was I mean, perfect. Every, every perfect sound bite, one after another yeah. in Spanish. It was a good thing that at least she spoke decent Spanish. She interviewed him in Spanish. So he felt a little more comfortable. So it was one uh, sound bite after uh, another. Can you, uh, Wall Street Journal, obviously, can you imagine? You know, that they were. Don Perignon all over the, the newsroom man, with something like this. Yeah. So it, it's very it's very easy for the empire in uh, Latin America. In Africa, not anymore. And in Eurasia, forget it. Because they are being contested from West Asia to East Asia to Northeast Asia, our friends from the, the PRK. Now, mm -hmm. even more closely linked with Russia and China. So now we have an, a, a, a real axis of evil, Russia, China, DPRK, right? So, so no yeah. wonder they're freaking out, uh, uh, Danny. No wonder, no wonder. Uh, but uh, when you discuss this with Russians, which are, as you know, very, very realistic and extremely precise, they think mathematically in terms. They say, no, they're, they're, they're going to keep postponing this thing because they will always come up with a diversion. And then they turn global public opinions attention for instance to one of their own diversions so this this thing keeps uh, rolling on even though their power is being undermined little by little but this could go on for decades at least it's true yeah i mean the the regression that we're seeing i mean it's 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 a really is a regression of you know the united states the the neocons the xiocons they had all these plans to move to the bigger fish to move to the the great powers russia and china now they find themselves back in west asia in a scenario that seems you know just untenable and untenable. how how much does this have to do with i'm wondering uh, the fact that you have this massive defeat in Ukraine, which is a huge blow to the encirclement and containment and destabilization agenda against Russia. You also have had the Biden administration, uh, the United States and Europe all have to do many, many, many uh, circles uh, around China from aggression and rolling back then feel, you know, playing at diplomacy. So how? How much of this is almost, you, you say, you know, they're going crazy, but how much does it have to do with the fact that, you know, West Asia, of course, is very strategic and, uh, you know, whether it was the war on Syria or all of the provocations with Iran over the many years, we've known that the, the greater road is to Moscow and, and Beijing, that that's where the neocons want to take it but at the same time by regressing backwards how how much is this is an acknowledgement that well uh, there really is no other option because i think the united states knows pretty well given its uh, uh, very contradictory rhetoric that uh, you know russia kicked their butts in syria that, that, that they were basically forced to roll back their destabilization and regime change effort in syria it's not going to go any better in a no. road to Iran. It's going to go much, much worse. So they know this, but yet they're back. So how much of this has to do with conceding that that at this moment, uh, Russia and China are, are untouchable in, in, in many ways? That's the problem. They grudgingly have to admit that they cannot do absolutely anything to contain 
the ascension of China, the strategic partnership, uh, Russia-China strategic partnership, the fact they are both coordinating the expansion of BRICS, the fact that sooner, in fact, sooner rather than later, and sooner means this year, 2024, the year of the great decision, in fact, we're going to start having practical mechanisms that will accelerate de-dollarization. This was one of, this was the key uh, theme of my, my dinner last night and my lunch today. We were discussing that. I, I cannot publish anything at the moment. It, it's confidential, but you're going to hear some very, very important things happening in the next few months. So this means it, it's accelerating, I would say, relatively fast. Uh, uh, I talked to, uh, about some of these things with Michael Hudson. and uh, is Mike, Michael, uh, uh, so it's confidential. Michael, he won't be publishing anything for the moment about that. And as soon as we have, uh, let's say, a roadmap, of what's going to happen in the next uh, few months, especially before the BRICS summit in Kazan in October. Uh, and then uh, Michael is going to be one of the key guys who's going to, to get on board and probably explain, especially for an American audience, what, uh, what's in the works. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, technically, it's it's a bit complicated, especially to explain in layman terms. Uh, in fact, I am being briefed. I am learning from these guys, you know. And of course, uh, as soon as we have direct Russian uh, endorsement, so this means the Russian government will be behind what's going to happen next. This means that sooner or later the Chinese government will be behind that and the other BRICS. And this is the idea, to have this ball rolling before the summit in October. And this is, it's, it's very interesting because these uh, negotiations on de-dollarization, they were much more advanced within the Eurasia Economic Union with our friend Glaziev, who is the minister, the minister in charge of the macroeconomics of the Eurasia Economic Union. But now, because of BRICS, the Russians, okay, no, this is a, our presence is presidency of BRICS this year. We need to come up with something very solid and very fast to show to the partners and to show to the global south as a whole. So that's an extra incentive. Uh, this week, early this week here, we had the meeting, the first meeting of the BRICS uh, Sherpas and Sue Sherpas. You know, the guys who prepare everything and they have to discuss everything. So it's good. Uh, Ryabkov, the first uh, the deputy um, foreign minister was, was there. He, he's the point man in Russia coordinating all that. Lavrov went there. Lavrov then talked about it. So, so, so okay, are, everybody's very optimistic. But don't forget, it's very complicated. You're going to have to, uh, on the same table and with the same policies, you have to satisfy the Indians, the Brazilians, Saudi Arabia. You know, it's very, very, Iran, it's very, very complicated. But they're up to the challenge. They're up to the challenge because when they look at the geopolitical map and the uh, incandescent possibilities that... Um, Certainly, the hegemon are going to pick up to, you know, basic, basically the, the number one agenda is set fire to West Asia. We discussed that in, in our previous uh, podcasts. Why? Because West Asia is essential for the Belt and Road Initiative. Belt, uh, West Asia is essential for the overarching Chinese idea. And it's essential in terms of unifying West Asia, unifying most some of the most important lands of Islam means these lands of Islam doing more trade with other parts of the world, not only Eurasia but the other parts of the world as well. So, what is the hegemon? The hegemon is based on divide and rule, as all of you know. What's plan A with no plan B? Let's, let's set fire to West Asia, which is exactly what's happening now, right? As the, the previous um, uh, set fire to is, okay, how do we set fire to Russia? Okay, we set fire in Ukraine, and the fire in Ukraine is going to contaminate Russia. We all know where is this going at the moment, right? 
So, you know, they are specialists in failed wars because it's the only, as the empire of uh, forever wars, is the only thing that they know how to do. The problem now is we are dealing with uh, an absolutely out of control vassal, the aircraft carrier in Israel. And they have their own agenda, which is not the agenda of those different silos in Washington. No, it's the agenda of those from that special tribe or tribes who believe that they run the world. And that, that's why it gets so much more complicated. These are the only people who can relaunch a failed war on terror and get away with it. Nobody's going to say this is absurd. Only, only us independents. But this is our job. We have to do that. But the system, you know, the system that still runs uh, geoeconomics and geopolitics around the world, most of it, they say, oh, okay, no problem. You know. After all, these, uh, these people control the system as well. And that's what's so complicated. It's much more complicated now. If we thought that we had a complicated geopolitical situation in 2001, post 9-11, no, now it's the real deal. Because now it's an accumulation of failures. Now it's the cosmic humiliation of NATO as a whole in Ukraine, which they can't disguise by any means that they think, oh, it's going to have a ceasefire. Are oh, we going to fire Zalush? Who cares? These are details. The, the, the most important thing is you cannot escape your cosmic humiliation, period. And the whole planet is watching. And now, with set fire in West Asia, you know, really going on a set fire mood all over the place. That, that's how we are. We are really in the, under, now we are totally under the volcano. There's no question about that. Unfortunately, I wish I could be more optimistic to all of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the timing of all of this, uh, this regression, this, uh, uh, descent into another major quagmire in West Asia is is very interesting given the headway Russia and China have made in West Asia, the various developments around BRICS that you mentioned, around diplomacy, around the fact that West Asia for, uh, uh, you know, for so many years has been divided and conquered. And over the last several years, it's been a very rapid change. It seems like mm. over the last half decade alone, we've seen many, many, many years more worth of progress toward a more united West Asia, integrated West Asia with uh, the multipolar world. So it's very interesting that now we have the out of control, given that both US and Israeli foreign policy are completely aligned in the divide and conquer balkanization strategy. It's very interesting that they both are playing mm -hmm. kind of a, a <laughs> their own their own forms uh, of escalating this kind of war. Yeah, but perhaps we can, uh, unless you want to, uh, 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 closing comments on that. Mm. No, I, I I would strongly recommend all of you, uh, if possible. Of, of course, reading it for a, an English speaking audience, reading in French is is complicated, but. Uh, well, with help of a Yandex uh, or a Deep L or any good translation mechanism, try to read at least the basic points. I, I outlined the basic points of Emmanuel Todd's book, and you can try to go further by trying to read in translation some parts of uh, some uh, sections of his book. And Glenn Deason's book, I strongly recommend it. If you want to have the full background of the Ukraine war, starting. You can say that he started in the 19th century, in fact. It's excellent. There's a, there's a stretch that is beautiful when he talks about the Eurasianists in the 1920s. Uh, and they were already thinking about multip multipolarity. Fascinating. Uh, there's another thing that he dug up uh, uh, a quote from uh, the selected words of Deng Xiaoping, which is absolutely extraordinary. You're going to see that in the column. I reproduced it uh, verbatim. Uh, it's something that Deng said in 1990. That is, even before he went on that famous uh, tour in southern China, where this was the big boost for China to start growing 10%, 12%, 14% a year. 
And Deng was talking about multipolarity in 1990. No wonder. Well, I, I consider him the most important uh, political figure of the 20th century. And, ma and, many, and, and many people would agree. No wonder. He was a real visionary. And in fact, he had the vision of how to turn China into, a, I would say, a moderate, wealthy country. But at the same time, the number one trade and economic power in the world. It's all due to Deng. And it's great that Glenn um, uh, revived a little bit of the importance of Deng. So, so this, these are two details, uh, um, literary re related, let, let's put it this way. The other thing is uh, keep, keep a very, very close eye to what the BRICS are going to do throughout this year. Because uh, um, it, it's something that we discussed here at the end of last year. Like, you know, look, guys, you have one year. To, you have one shot and one year to do it. If you blow it, we are all fucked. <laughs> all of us. <laughs> and obviously, the, the Russians totally understand that. You know. And uh, we, we're going to see, especially after the elections, uh, next month are the, uh, the elections here. Uh, Vladimir, of course, is going to be reelected. So there's going to be a new. There's going to be some key changes in key posts, including the Russian Foreign Ministry. We still don't know who's going to be the next one. Could be some changes in the Ministry of Defense as well. And obviously, they will want to speed up everything in um, Ukraine. Uh, don't forget that there is a, an on-the-record promise by Shoigu made a few months ago that the SMO is going to finish in 2025. So he already gave a date. So they have to, there's a lot of mopping up to do in 2024, right? Um, and this is something that we're going to learn in the, in the next few weeks. It's great. I'm going to be here for two months. So we're going to have a lot of stuff here from, uh, from the lion's mouth in the, in the next few weeks, right? These, these next few weeks are very, very important. There's a multipolar conference at the end of February. There's the elections in March. And then we, we, we can expect the, 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 the BRICS train leading to the summit in, uh, in, in October to pick up a lot of speed. So, so in terms of uh, having a, a, a more realistic and, uh, let's say, slightly more auspicious outlook for the future, this is where it's happening. And in sharp contrast to the under the volcano situation in West Asia. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video. Thank you.